You are about to listen to a message by Apostle Joseph Minter. Apostle Joseph Minter is the head pastor and leader of Torch World Ministries, an all-encompassing network of ministries. Through his teachings of the Word, healing, deliverance and declarations, the power of God has transformed many lives. Now the Word of God. Illegitimate authority, part two. There are four strands of illegitimate authority in scripture and that these four strands are named after these four personalities Jezebel, Balaam, Cain and Korah and if we want to understand illegitimate authority then we can look at them so Jezebel stands for witchcraft Balaam also um, stands for um, sorcery Cain stands for presumption and Korah stands for rebellion. So today I'm talking about presumption. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your presence. We pray that even as your word is coming, you will help us to open our hearts to receive your word. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Okay. We thank God for um, today. You are welcome to church this morning. I'm talking on illegitimate authority, part two. And I'm talking on the way of Cain. The way of Cain. Uh, we all know Cain, Abel's brother Cain. Uh, <coughs> So, illegitimate authority, uh, the part one was on witchcraft. And then we, we looked at witchcraft and then we also looked at overcoming projections and the programming of witchcraft. Uh, then this is the part two. And uh, when you read the Bible in scriptures like Jude verse 11, um, you're going to see certain names that are, that are mentioned there. Now, these, these names are, are personifications of certain, uh, certain things. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for prophets, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So, the way of Cain, the error of Balaam, and the rebellion of Korah. These, these are... Um, human beings who personify illegitimate authority and then we can also add Revelation 2.20 um, which is um, talking about Jezebel. It said nevertheless I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual morality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So, there are four strands of illegitimate authority in scripture and that these four strands are named after these four personalities. Jezebel, Balaam, Cain, and Korah. And if you want to understand illegitimate authority, then we can look at them. So, Jezebel stands for witchcraft. Balaam also um, stands for um, sorcery. Cain stands for presumption, and Korah stands for rebellion. So today I'm talking about presumption. Presumption. Uh, you know, witchcraft is when you attempt to manipulate people. Presumption is when you think you can manipulate God. That's presumption. When you think you can manipulate God or bend, get him to bend his will. That is presumption. And that is... Um, the sin that Cain committed. The sin of Cain. Now, for us to get a, the background, uh, let's read Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 to 24. Genesis 4, 1 to 24, so that we can get the background. And Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. Okay. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel, now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground, which means an earthly-minded person. 
And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And take note, it didn't say rotten, rotten stuff or uh, rotten food stuff. No. It said he, he brought an offering of the fruits of the ground to the Lord. Okay. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, we will not be accepted. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with his brother, with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Okay, so then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Now notice that this is the first time God is cursing a human being. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth. No, no, no. Go to verse 12. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A figurative and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a figurative and a vagabond on the earth. It will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. The word Nod means wandering, wandering, to wander on the east of Eden. Anytime you, you move away from God's presence, you, the next thing is that you, you, you start wandering. You start hitting your head against things, you know. Then you are wandering, like Cain was wandering. Verse 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she bore, she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Okay, so we can end here. Now, you see a lot of first, first, first things in Cain's life, but he missed the first of the first. He missed God. He had a lot of first things. Number one, he was the firstborn. He was the first person to bring a sacrifice to God. Cain brought his sacrifice before Abel brought his own. He was the first person to talk rudely to God. Adam never did talk to God like that. He was the first person to commit murder. A lot of first, first, first in Cain's life. He was the first person to be cursed. God didn't curse Adam. God cursed the ground for Adam's sake. He punished Adam, but he never, he never said you are cursed. But the first person that God said you are cursed was Cain. And was the first person to be marked by God. So God started marking people before the Antichrist would come and give people a mark. So if you are afraid of the mark of the beast, then just get the mark of the Lord. So God also gives mark. But he was the first person to build a city. That's the mercy of God. That's, that shows the magnanimity of God. That the first person who departed from God was the same first person who built a city. Not, not even the people of God. Cain, who was cursed. Which means that even Africa, we don't have any, any excuse. And you don't have any excuse, you know, because even if you are cursed, you can, can build a city. That's how generous God is. So don't allow any curse to stop you. Now, the way of Cain is presumption. But when we say a way, we are talking about a precedent that has been set, a pathway that has been created. Uh, the way of Cain didn't start with Cain. It started with Lucifer. 
when Lucifer rebelled against God and said, I will ascend. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will also sit on the side or on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. That I will, that I will, I will be like the Messiah. That those five I wills of Lucifer created a pathway, a pathway, if you like, it created another way of life. Before Lucifer said, I will, there was only one will that was prevailing, God's will. So his will was in heaven, was on earth as it was in heaven. Then one day, Lucifer said, I will. And God didn't stop him. God said, let these two paths run to its logical conclusion. And let's see who wins at the end. So when Adam came on the scene, God was frank with Adam. They didn't hide anything from Adam. If you check the scriptures, you will see that um, there were already two trees in the garden. Go to Genesis 2 verse 8 and 9. There were already two trees in the garden. Okay, He said, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had for. And notice this scripture very well. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. It didn't say the Lord God also planted the tree of life and planted the tree of knowledge. See, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. These two trees were already dead before Adam came. And God was so frank with Adam. He said, look, there are two parts. You can take either of two parts. Because Satan has created one part called I will. And I have another part, I have the, the main part called my will, God's will. So if you eat from I will, you will surely die. Because the one who started I will is now dead. It's not cut off from life. That's Satan. But the part that he created is there. So Adam, you have a choice. People sometimes say, if God knew that man was going to fall, why did God plant the tree? No, no, it wasn't God who said, I'm going to plant a tree. Those two trees had to be dead because they represented the two paths that was in existence. That was reality. So God said, look, as you have come, you have a choice to make. The tree of life represented God's will. God's way. God's will. God's way, God's life. The tree of knowledge represented I will. My way, I will. So when Satan came, what the serpent did was not to tell Adam to rebel against God per se. He told Adam to to, 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 to govern himself. Take the path of I will. He said, you shall be as God's. Knowing good and evil, you don't need anybody to determine what is good, what is evil for you. No benchmark, no absolutes. You will be a law unto your own self. That's a path that is good. You will be in control. No need to render account to anybody. No accountability, no responsibility. You are truth unto yourself. Truth is relative. What you see, what, you, what feels good, that's what you should do. Adam, Adam said, good idea. I think I like this system of government. I don't want to be a regent. Like, I don't want to be like um, somebody who is a steward who must render account of my stewardship. I want to be somebody who owes nobody any explanation. So Adam chose that path. As soon as he chose that path, that path was created by Lucifer and uh, there were three things that uh, dotted that path. The first one was self-will self-will that part of i will was dotted by three things self-will pride and ambition self-will pride and ambition you can define sin as these three things you can you can define sin as these three things self-will pride and ambition okay then as soon as Eve ate the fruit 
which means that she partook of the tree of knowledge. She chose I will and then convinced Adam to also choose I will. And uh, Adam did not fall accidentally. It was Eve that was deceived. The man was not deceived. According to, I think, 1 Timothy 2.14, or, you know, he said, for Adam was not deceived. It was the woman that was deceived. But Adam fell because of love, because she loved his wife. He loved his wife. So he, he, he just had to follow her you know, and fell. So God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have not obeyed my commandment, cursed is the ground for your sake. And that they lost the garden. They lost, um, they lost dominion, the uh, authority. They lost the glory because they chose the part of I will. Because this part of I will, you know, it, it produces three things. When they ate the fruit, their immediate reaction was that they looked at themselves and they knew that they were naked. So it gave birth to self-centeredness or selfishness. That's where, that, is, that, is, that is when selfishness was born. It was born in the Garden of Eden when Adam ate the fruit. When Eve ate the fruit, nothing happened because Eve was not the foundation. It was Adam that was the foundation. The foundation is destroyed. What can the righteous do? So when Adam ate the fruit, then the foundation was destroyed. Then, after they looked at themselves, the next reaction was they attempted to cover themselves. Self-effort. The second born of the tree of knowledge is self-effort. Then the third born of the tree of knowledge is selfish ambition. These three things, they never leave the path of I will. Anytime you want to live life on your own without recourse to God, you'll find these things in your life. You'll be self-centered. You'll find self-effort. You'll find selfish ambition. It means you are on the path of I will. So, when Cain came, Cain already, see, these things were already there. It was in Adam and Eve as a seed. Then Cain came to practice it. Practice it. The sin of Cain was presumption. Cain thought he had toiled because God had cursed the ground. So it was not easy cultivating or harvesting or planting anything. But Cain used his strength to plant crops and then brought them to God to offer them to God. And God said, I've rejected it. Because number one, the ground is cursed. So anything the ground produces is cursed. And you cannot offer an accursed thing to the Lord. Number two, you don't tell me what to do. I am the Lord. I'm sovereign. I must tell you what to do, what to bring. You don't just get up and say, I brought this. So accept, accept it. It's presumption. Nobody orders God about Nobody decides for God. Nobody can bend the will of God. It is presumption to think that you can change God's mind with anything or you can get God's approval with anything or you can get God to bend his will for anything without what he himself has prescribed. That's presumption. Now, so, the presumption of Cain was seen in his disregard for divine patterns. Cain didn't respect divine patterns. You know, Abel, Bible says he offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by faith. When it says by faith, it means that Abel was instructed by God. It was God's prescription that Abel followed. So that's why I said by faith. By faith means by listening to God. Because faith comes come by hearing and hearing by the word. So, when we say somebody is, is taking a step of faith, it means the person has heard from God and the person is acting out what God said. When you do it the other way around, it's not faith. Anybody can just get up and say, I'm traveling. I don't know where I'm going. I'm traveling. It will not be faith. But Abraham's throne was faith because it was God who said, leave your father's house. Leave your family to a land I will show you. And so Abraham didn't know where he was going, but he left the, the family because of what God said. That is faith. Faith is always premised on that says the Lord. 
what God has said. Without God's word, there's no faith. So, presumption or the way of Cain, I'm going to give you certain things that are snapshot, snapshots or they are, they are signposts, signposts on the way of Cain. Signposts on the way of Cain. The first one is self-righteousness. Anything that starts with self stinks in God's nostrils. Anything that starts with self, self-motivation, self-made, self-righteousness, selfish ambition, self-centeredness, anything that is self, self, it stinks in God's nostrils because it reminds God of the I will path that Lucifer created, that Adam also followed. And anybody who starts thinking about self, 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 you are walking in the path of Cain, in the way of Cain. What is self-righteousness? Self-righteousness is attempting to get into right standing with God through unapproved means. And unapproved means means that through prescription that God did not give. That is self-righteousness. Right from the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God established two principles. The principle of righteousness and the principle of faith. And when God came on the scene, Adam and Eve, uh, even though they had attempted to clothe themselves with fig leaves, they were afraid and said, because they were naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? Who told you? Have you eaten of the tree that I said you should not eat of? Okay, long story short. God came on the scene and then clothed them with coats of skin. Now, they thought they were covering themselves with fig leaves. When God came on the scene, the fig leaves still could not cover them. They were still naked. And God made for Adam and his wife tunics of skin, coats of skin, which means there was the shedding of blood, the killing of an animal, which I believe uh, most more likely to be a lamb, and then the covering of Adam and Eve with the skin of the lamb. What was God doing? God was saying that you will be justified before me by things that come from me. Anything that does not come from me can never clothe you, can never cover you, can never justify you. You will only be justified by what comes from me. My prescription. That is the principle of righteousness. That righteousness to come in right alignment with God must be by responding to God's prescription, not your prescription. So God established right there that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. That's uh, Hebrews 9.22. He said, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That principle was established right in the Garden of Eden. And God, to, God was telling them that, look, you guys thought you had covered yourselves, but you are still naked. Unless I cover you, you are never truly covered in my sight. So you are never righteous unless you, you respond to God's prescription. And God's prescription in the Bible ultimately was Christ. But even before Christ, God's prescription was seen in ties and shadows. So the Bible says God's righteousness, they were revealed from faith to faith. Romans 1.17 Because during the time of Noah, God's righteousness was to enter the ark. You, you, you could have been the most, the most perfect human being alive. If you didn't enter the ark, you will never be saved. Doesn't matter how good you were. Doesn't matter whatever you did. God's righteousness at that time was the ark. No ark, no salvation. Then from there, you can talk of um, maybe Abraham's time. God's righteousness was circumcision. That all those who have been circumcised, they were the people of God. He said, He gave to Abraham circumcision as a seal of righteousness, the seal of righteousness. 
That was circumcision. So it didn't matter. I mean, you, 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 could, you could have been the most perfect person in Abraham's time. Without circumcision, you, you, were, you were not righteous. You were not in right standing with God. You were not in right alignment with God. Then he came to the people of Israel. That time, God's righteousness was seen in animal sacrifice. Sacrificing the sheep, the goat, the cow, the turtle dove, or the young pigeon. These five animals. Outside of these five animals, and in fact, outside of animal sacrifice, nobody could be justified before God. That was God's righteousness. So the Bible says it was revealed from faith to faith. From faith. These were shadows of the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate prescription of God. That would be the blood of Jesus. So in Romans 10 verse 4, the Bible says, For Christ, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So now, God's righteousness is Christ. If you are not in Christ, you, you, you don't please God. He said, uh, uh, um, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. In, in whom? You have to be in him to please him. So, outside of Christ, there's no hope for humanity. There is no salvation for humanity. There is no righteousness. You can be the most morally sound person on earth. If you are not in Christ, you are not righteous. It is self-righteousness. Now, anything you do to attain salvation, apart from the work that Christ has already finished, is called self-righteousness. It's called legalism. You cannot attain salvation outside of the work that Christ has already done. That is self-righteousness. Then the principle of faith that God also established is that man will have to believe God's prescription in order to establish a relationship with God. So Hebrews 11 verse 6, it says that whoever comes to God must believe, but without faith it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please him without faith. For you must believe that God is. And God is a rewarder. So self-righteousness is when you think you can attain salvation through any other means apart from what Christ has done. Some people can say, well, um, I don't do A, B, C. Why do I need Christ? I don't do A, B, C. I, I don't sin. I, I, I don't... I don't do this. I don't commit this sin. Commit that sin. So, I don't need Christ. There are many people who, who say that to say that, well, I don't need to go to church because I can do this or I don't do this sin or that sin. Even those in church, they do this sin. I don't do them. So, I am right with God. No, no, sir. You are not right with God. You can only be right with God when you go through Christ. And your good deeds will only count after you have come to Christ. All the good things you do outside of Christ, Bible calls them filthy rags. You are clothing yourself with filthy rags when you are using your good works to obtain salvation. Good works come after salvation, not before salvation. So, in the Bible, we have two works. Works and then good works. When the Bible says works, it's referring to things you do that you think will, will, will earn you a right standard with God. You think will earn you approval from God. You think will earn you salvation from God. Bible calls those things works. But the Bible calls the things you do after you have obtained salvation good works. And you, let me give you two scriptures. In fact, uh, listening to the message I preached on the second born of the tree of knowledge in 2017. Okay, but let's read Titus 3 5. I want to give you these two, these two things, works and good works, in the same passage. Go to verse 4. Okay. Um, 
But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared toward man, uh, okay, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So here it says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It means that you, your salvation was not determined by the things you did. It was determined by the things Christ did. You were not born again because you were a good person or because you had a good upbringing or because you, you, you had good uh, values or because you, 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 you lived the, uh, uh, the right kind of life. No. You were born again because somebody chose to die in your place. And when you believe Christ, that Christ died in your place, that's when you have been born again. That is when you can produce good works. Good works are your, the works that you, the fruit of the spirit, the fruit that you bear as a natural result of being connected to the vine. It is not what is we are going to use to get salvation. Now go to verse, verse um, 11. You will see good works. That's after salvation. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. So good works is mentioned after salvation, not before salvation. Is it Works is like what you, you, you think you can use to obtain salvation. That is presumption. It's an affront to the cross. But good works, you are expected to produce good works after you are saved because of the seed that abides in you. Because when you are saved, that seed that abides in you will grow to produce fruit. We are saved by the incorruptible seed, but we bear fruit to glorify God. So the fruit is not what saved you. The, the seed is what saved you. The fruit is a natural consequence of the seed that is in you. So if after being born again for some time, a long time, there's no fruit, check the seed. Maybe you were never truly born again in the first place. Because if you are born again, it's not of your works. The seed is put into you. But the seed will grow, giving time, giving uh, the food, diet, and all that. The seed must grow into fruit. So it's not the seed that glorifies God is a fruit. The seed does not benefit God. The seed benefits you. It is you that were born again when you received the seed. 1 Peter 1.23 1 Peter You have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, even by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. But then John 15.8 Hearing is my father glorified. That you bear fruit. So God doesn't get glory through the seed because the seed came from him. But then your fruit is what gives him glory. Let your light so shine before men that it may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. Then go to Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10. In that, in that little passage, you will see these two, these two works. Works and then um, good works. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. You see the word works. Lest anyone should boast. So wait. Here it says you have been saved by grace through faith. Not of works. It means that your works did not contribute to your salvation. It was purely an act of grace. The only thing that was needed from you was faith, your response, your, your belief in God's prescription. That is what justified you. And even that one, it was God who made it possible for you to have the faith. Go to verse 10. But now, after you have been saved by grace, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So works versus good works. Self-righteousness is when you try to attain right standing with God through anything apart from Christ's sacrifice. But then after God has declared you righteous, that is when your good works will start showing. So never say, oh, after me, I was, I was good from my childhood. I was good. Our family, we are, we are very, very uh, morally sound. That did not get you born again. That, it, that, that's not why you got born again. You, you, you got born again purely by an act of God's mercy and God's grace. But after born again, then your, your good works will show. So, the first signpost on the way of Cain is self-righteousness. God hates self-righteousness. That's why all religions who do not accept and acknowledge Christ's sacrifice, God does not know them. Human beings are very proud. If God has said, for you to be saved, climb this mountain, run, run this number of kilometers, you will see how people will do it. So that we can pride ourselves and say, yeah, I've purchased my salvation. The Bible says God has concluded all under sin. Whether you had 49% or you had zero, the past mark is 50, you didn't attain the past, but you are filled. That's how God sees it. You can have 49%. You have still filled. You cannot make the, mark, the past mark. It, it takes Christ to provide the shortfall. Somebody has zero, you had 49, and the past mark is 50. You have both filled. Is that not so? You have filled. You can brag and say, well, I had 49. You are still filled. So God has concluded all men under sin. Everybody has filled. For, for all have sinned and come short. Only Christ provides a shortfall for you to become God's righteousness. Bring you to alignment. Then after that, God will now start looking at your good ways. Your good ways are just fruits which represents your thanksgiving, appreciation to God. Even in the Old Testament, they were not justified by the, 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 the commandment that God gave them. No. They were justified by the blood of animals. That is what separated Israel from the unbelievers. The blood, the blood, the blood. Not the things, the rituals they carry out. Like Sabbath, like uh, don't eat this, don't eat that. Those things, they did them. They did those righteous, righteous things that God gave them to do. They did them as appreciation to God. They were delivered from Egypt by the blood. Not by keeping the commandment. By the blood. They, they believe in the blood. Number two signpost on the way of king is assessing God on your own terms. It is presumption of the highest kind to approach God on your own terms. Cain thought he could offer what he wanted. That was just what he had. But that was not what God wanted. You can't approach God on your terms. It's presumption. You must approach God on his terms. He must show you what he wants. The pathway to God is come up here. If you decide to break into God's realm, for instance, you can, you can contact demons. Unless there's an invitation. Come up here. If you say, I want to see something. I want to have a vision. I want to press. I want to see something. You can break into some realm that is demonic. Because outside of God's prescription, there's no protection. Protection is only granted within God's prescription. God says, come up here. That's why you can go without problems. Without the devil interfering. He said, come up here. Unless God extends the invitation, if you decide to go, it's presumption. You are, you are tempted to assess God on his own terms. Do you know that all powers that we have in this world are, is God's power, including Satan's power? All the power that the devil is using, the malam, the fetish priest, the occult, all the power they are using is God's power. Nobody has any power. But they are trying to assess that power through unapproved means. 
That's why when you try to assess God through unapproved means, you can contact evil spirits because there's no protection outside of God's prescription. In the Old Testament, people who went to God uninvited were killed. Leviticus 16 verse 1 to 2. In the Old Testament, if you intruded into God's office, you were killed. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. Do you know why they offered profane fire? Why they died? Because God instructed them that any fire you will use for all manner of services in the tabernacle must come from the, bro the bronze altar in the outer court. Then they brought fire from their home. Come and burn east as the holy place. And then God killed them. Continue to verse 2. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So in the Old Testament for instance, if you ventured into the Holy of Holies without invitation and proper prescription by God, you will die because it is presumptuous. You can't assess God on his stairs. The reason why we can approach God is because he said, come boldly to the throne of grace. That is the access that God has granted us in the New Testament. That's why we can approach God. Are you getting me? But even that one, there are still protocols to assess God's power and presence. You cannot assess God outside of his will. When you attempt to assess God's power, for instance, outside of his will, outside of his word, outside of his ways, you can encounter demonic power. That's why there are many people who have been demonized without knowing. Because they, they thought they were trying to assess God. But they, they were assessing God through unapproved methods. Anything that God has, has used before, and he has left it, he has left it, demons occupy. Because when God passes by, there's a trail, there's power left in his trail. That's why the rod of Moses, that Moses used to heal those who had are, who are been bitten by snakes. That rod, in 2 Kings 18, people of Israel were still offering incense to that rod. And they called it Nehustan. And God was angry. Now, do you think they were not getting results? They were getting results. Only a fool will keep on doing something he's not getting results from. So these guys were offering incense to the bronze serpent that Moses had used. God has used many years ago and abandoned. And they were still getting results from offering incense to the bronze serpent. But it was deception. God was not in it. But they had results. You can try to assess God through unapproved routes and still get results, but you will be demonized. You become a prey in the hand of the devil in the long run. Somebody can say, because I mentioned in the name of Jesus and say, let, come, let me use leaves to cast out uh, spiritual marriage. Let me, use, let me combine some leaves and then so that I can deliver you from spiritual marriage. Now, the person is trying to assess God's power, but it is through unapproved roots. Because in the New Testament, the way we deal with demons is to cast them out by a word in the name of Jesus. Now, in the Old Testament, they used canal methods and God allowed that. They used canal methods and God allowed that dispensation. Now, anything that God has stopped using, the devil quickly occupies. That is why Paul said, if you want to go back under the law, then you are cursed. Was, was it not God who gave the law to them? But God had moved on. He had stopped using the law. So the devil had occupied it. So if you try to go under the law, then you'll be a curse. So anybody who is a, who, who, who tries to, let's say, for instance, right now, if you say, okay, now I'm going to offer animal a sacrifice so that I can, I can assess God. Let me tell you, a demon can respond to you 
and you can receive some kind of power, it will not be from God. Because you are trying to assess God outside of his will, his word, and his ways. That's why we need to know the ways of God. We need to know the will of God. We need to know the word of God. If you try to assess God through God's power through creation, for instance, you can contact evil spirits. Because there was a time people tried to assess God through his creation. That the leaves were made by God. So if I want to get to God, I can use the leaves. But in this situation, it is faith. It's a God who a sundry time spoke to the fathers through the prophets. Hebrews 1 has in this last day spoken to us through the Son. That's all. Now, God's communication to mankind in this last day is the Son. S-O-N. That anything that does not pass through the Son is not God's communication. That's why he said the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Any prophetic utterance that does not administer Christ's likeness cannot be from God. Okay. Any other method apart from God's word, God's will, God's ways is suspect. And it can be intercepted by the devil. So be careful of, of following prescriptions. Prescriptions that are given by people that are not in line with God's word God's will, God's way, you are going to open yourself for demonic, demonic attacks and influence. You will be demonized. Number two, okay, go to Hebrews 1, 3 to 4. Um, okay, so I'm giving you this scripture. Hebrews 1, 3 to 4. It said, he upholds all things by the word of his power. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Then, then Galatians 3, 5. He said, he that works miracles among you, does he work the miracles through the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So everything that God does now, okay, it is through his word. You want to know the will of God? The will of God is the word of God. What he has said. The will of God is the ways of God. He said, the children of Israel knew the acts of God. Moses knew the ways of God. We must know the ways of God. How God behaves. How God does things. We must not be ignorant of his ways. Otherwise, we can try to assess his power through unapproved rules. The second signpost on the, the path of, on the way of Cain is putting sacrifice before obedience. It is presumption to try to justify disobedience with sacrifice. It is presumption. God hates that. You are trying to circumvent God. And you cannot do use sacrifice to appease God for your disobedience. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, 23, look at what Saul learned. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. He said, you can't bribe God. God says, go and kill the Amalekites. Then you say, well, I brought the best of sacrifice, the best of the flock as sacrifice to God. So even though I did not really carry out the instruction, here is my seed to appease God. He it said it's presumption. You can't use sacrifice to justify disobedience. It's presumption. Cain learned a bitter lesson. God rejected Cain. Now, you are bringing sacrifice, fine, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for you, your heart. You are not uh, on the same page with me, you are out of alignment and you are bringing sacrifice. What for? Notice that he said, God 
respected Abel first and then his offering. And God rejected Cain first and then his offering. So God looks at you before what is in your hand. Because, because he said, for, for God is which the poor said of the people of um, Macedonia, for God is witness that they give themselves first to God and then to us, his messengers. So, the first sacrifice is, are you obeying what God said you should do? Once you veer of the path of righteousness, and you know the path of righteousness, that is the path of God's will, not I will. That path is a path of faith, is a path of relationship, is a path of obedience. Once you veer off that path, no amount of sacrifice will suffice. God was not pleased with all the fat sacrifice Saul was given because he violated God's instruction and he was out of alignment with God. He needed to come into alignment with God first before God would look at the sacrifice. You can't, you can't bend God's will with sacrifice. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings to the Lord and God accepted it because he was in alignment with God. He was, he was carrying out the instructions of God. So his sacrifice carried weight. He wasn't using the sacrifice, thousand burnt offerings and God said, build a temple. Then you say, let me offer thousand burnt offerings so that God can forget about the temple that he said I should build. That's presumption. Sacrifice before obedience will lead to sweat. God hates sweat. Not, not the sweat I'm wiping from my face. Not that sweat. You know what sweat stands for? Sweat stands for self-effort. So in the Bible, come to Ezekiel 44, 15 to 18. Look at God's prescribed attire for the priest and why he did that. But the priest, the Levites, sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. They shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. Mm -hmm. And it shall be, whenever they enter the gates of the inner court, that they shall put on linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister within the gates of the inner court or within the house. They shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen trousers on their bodies. They shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat. Okay? Do you know why? Because sweat stands for self-effort without God. The, the, the punishment that Adam had was that you will eat from the sweat. God didn't say you will labor. He said you will toil. Labor is normal for any human being. Without labor, man will, will not be fulfilled. But toil was a punishment. He said you will toil. Now, so self-effort, sweat stands for self-effort. Whenever you are doing something for God, God must supply grace. If there's no grace for what you are doing, it's self-effort. Because grace is a fool, the fool that executes divine purposes. That's why God will never give you a task without giving you grace. So when you run ahead of God to do something, there's no grace. Because grace is released within the context of God's will, within the context of God's prescription. Once God says, lift up this thing, then grace is supplied. That's why, that's why we must place priority on relationship with God. That is where God's instructions, they spring from. And God's instructions, they go with grace. Grace is the fuel that God gives for the fulfillment of his purposes. 
So unprescribed attire is sweat, anything that causes sweat. You can't presume before God. You must respond to God's initiative. Our work with God is not, God does not need us to be creative. He wants us to be obedient, that's all. Creativity comes after obedience. It's not that like you are thinking of something to do for God. It's like God is asking you to do something for him. It's presumption. Number four, one of the signposts on the way of Cain, presumption, is doing God a service without his will. And the question is, can you do God a service without his will? And the answer is yes. That's why relationship, the, 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 the part of the tree of life is relationship, faith, intimacy, and righteousness, obedience. The part of the tree of knowledge is formula, steps, keys, and all that. God cannot be assessed with formula. It's relationship. So, Jesus went to Martha's house. I've said it before. Mary and Martha's house. It was, it was Martha who took Jesus into the house. And Martha went about cooking for Jesus and his entourage because he, he went with the disciples. And then Mary picked a chair and sat by Jesus, listening to the word of God. Then Martha came and said, Lord, Lord, why have you, my sister left me to do all the cooking and you are not saying anything. He, she's just here wasting time. Because to matter, anything outside of service does not matter. And so Mary is wasting her time. But the question is, matter, did Jesus tell you he was hungry? Did he tell you he was hungry? He wanted to eat? No. So why don't you ask him first, Lord, should I fix something for you? That was what Mary was doing. Mary was engaging him in a relationship so as to know his mind and the things that he, he likes. A time will come where Mary can do something it will not come by direct instruction, but he knows his heart. She knows his heart. So, she has, because she has grown to uh, be in a relationship with him to discern his voice, and so he can res she can respond to his nudges and nuances. So, relationship comes before anything that you want to do, want to do for God. That's why ministry doesn't begin with doing. Ministry doesn't begin with doing. What must I do for God? No. It begins with relationship. Because Mark 3.14 and Acts 4.13, look at what happened. Mark 3.14. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. The first, the, the, the first thing was that they might be with him. The second thing was conditional. He might send them out. So you can be with him and he might not send you out. You, you just be with him. But you can also be with him and then he will send you out. When he sent them out, go to Acts 4.13. Now they marveled the, the, when they saw the borders of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. He said that they might be with me and that I might send them out to preach. Now, when they had been with him and he sent them, people took notice that these guys had been with Jesus. Because relationship will let you know what he wants. That's the mandate. And how he wants it done, that's the blueprint. So you don't take off like a spaceship 
I always say a missionary is not a mission in a hurry. You have to stand in his counsel. You have to know, perceive his word. Jeremiah 21 verse, Jeremiah 23 verse 21. I've not sent these prophets, yet they run. I've not spoken to them, yet they prophesy. Huh? But if they have stood in my counsel, if they have stood in my counsel, and had caused my people to hear my word. You can't cause people to hear his words if you have not stood in his counsel. Then they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. 23. Okay. So, locating the will of God is very crucial in our work with God. Locating God's will is very, very crucial. And this is not a one-time event. This is not an event. Our whole lives should be a pursuit of his will. Ephesians 5.10 It said, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That should be our quest in everything. To find out what the Lord wants. There are things that God has already declared that he wants in the scriptures. When you do them, you are in the will of God. But there are things that are also specific that you must find out what God is saying. Once you locate his will, you can go all out. Because there are two broad aspects of God helping you locate his will. One is light for your path. The other is lamp for your feet. Listen carefully. Because somebody will say, well, how do I know whether God wants me to preach to this person? Life for your path is God's revealed will, general will for your life. As a Christian, as, as, as whatever, God's general will is contained in scripture. That is light for your path. He throws light on your path. For instance, when God calls you, God gives you a mandate. Now God tells you, okay, preach, go your mandate is A, B, C. These are the coordinates of your mandate. Now, within the coordinates of your mandate, you just keep moving. Sometimes, you know, there are times that God knows that, okay, this is the mandate he has given you, and you are just moving within the mandate. Now, he will come and then give you specifics and say, and that's the lamp for your feet, and say, okay, now, no, no, don't go here. Like Paul uh, in Acts 16, wanted to go to Phrygia, and the Spirit said, no, don't go to Phrygia. Then they said, okay, now let's try to go to Mysia, and the Spirit said, no, don't go to Mysia. Then Paul had a vision. They saw somebody from Macedonia come over and help us. Then he said, immediately the next day, they started sailing to Macedonia, concluding that God had called them to Macedonia to preach. God had called them to preach. They were just preaching. He said, go into the world. They were just preaching anywhere. Anywhere he didn't want to preach, he would stop them. You know, I remember um, last, 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 last week, this very last week, I was asking the Lord something as a practice. Anytime it's getting to my birthday, I will ask the Lord, what is the next thing to do? What is the next thing? What is it a new season? What is... So when I, when I was praying, I just tuned off. I just entered into, you know, the spirit. And I heard a loud voice, keep walking. You know, then I came back from the vision. Keep walking. It means that just go, just go. I'm with you, just go. That's the life for your part. But the lamp for your feet is when it comes and says, no, no, don't pass here, pass here. Pass here. And you know, the, the humorous thing is that when he said keep walking, and then I got up, it was around, um, let's say, one. So I got up and I went to the washroom and I came back. When I came back, you know, this, this month alone, three people gave me watches as gifts this month. And so when I came back, the watches were, they were in their boxes and they were there. I had not opened the boxes. I had not tried it on. So I said, in that, at that time, around one, I said, let me look at what is in the box. So I opened this one, opened that one. Then for one of them, the label fell down. 
And then I picked the label there. Excuse me, was keep walking. Time waits for no one. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. If you don't know, the same message, keep walking. It fell down, keep walking. <laughs> Time waits for no one. So I decided I'm going to wear the I'm going to wear the watches one after the other. So I'm wearing one today. Unless you can wear one. I'll wear one the following week. <laughs> I will not give them out as gifts. Now, so love for your feet is the day-to-day guidance. That one you need. You see, that's why sometimes when you are confused, you need to go for retreat. Go back and ask God. When you ask God and there's no response, keep doing what he asked you to do last. Yeah. Unless there's a response, God says, okay, change what you're doing, pass here, pass here. If there's nothing but God is saying, keep doing the last thing he said do so he comes to change the menu. Just keep doing it. It means that your obedience is not yet fulfilled or you have not yet fulfilled all righteousness as far as this thing is concerned. So keep doing it. So I come and say, now, okay, now move to the third gear. If you seek the will of God for your life, you can be, you can have a better judgment. Now, uh, John 5.30, John 5.30, it says that I can of myself do nothing. Look at Jesus. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Anytime you are not seeking gospel, your judgment will be poor. Anytime self takes the center stage, know that your judgment will be poor. Anytime you, 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 you act in selfishness, your judgment is poor. But when you see the will of God, he said you can judge well. John 6 and 8. He said, I came not to do my will, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. You can listen to the message I preached on fulfilling your prophetic destiny. I mentioned five types of the will of God that you must know. The sovereign will of God, the permissive will of God, the providential will of God, the moral will of God, and the perfect will of God. Five types. Now, some believers have not yet come to grips with what we call the sovereign the sovereignty of God. If you have not experienced that, you can be presumptuous. But when you encounter the sovereignty of God, like Paul, do you think Paul didn't have faith when he said when he was when he was begging God for this this tongue to depart from him three times? It was a level God was teaching Paul. The sovereignty of God. I know all your rights, all your privileges. I know. By faith, this, by faith, that, by faith, that. But Paul said, I besought the Lord three times that you depart from me. And God did not remove the, the pain. But God said, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. That level, that level is not. It's not for, it's not for, for children. That that level, the, the sovereignty of God. But that is when you really learn about presumption, because you can't presume anything in God's presence. You can't presume wisdom. You see, when you stand before God and you are like, I have the mind of Christ. I am wise. I, am, I you, you, it, it's, you see, you can't presume wisdom before God. You can't stand before God and say, I know my right. It is Satan that you demand your right for. You're not God. You don't go and say, I, 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 God, no, I know my right. You have to do this. I, no, you are joking. You come before God. You come before him as having nothing, knowing nothing. Come before your father. Don't come and presume anything before God. Solomon said, I don't know anything. And God said, okay, I'll give you wisdom. Moses said, I cannot talk. Jeremiah said, I'm a boy. God said, I'll help you. 
You don't qualify for God's help till you come to the place of brokenness. And brokenness is a state of the heart where you truly know that without him, I can do nothing. For as long as you can do something, you will not receive God's help. So God will bring you to a point where you are broken to know that without him, you can do nothing. Sometimes after all the principles you know, you have applied them. All the faith principles, you have applied them. You have, you have done this, done that, done that, and nothing is working. God is trying to drive home this point. You have not come to a place where you acknowledge that without you, I can do nothing. You need to bow down before God and say, God, I can't presume anything before you. Without you, I can do nothing. Number five, trying to help God. It is presumptuous. For you to think you can help God. Even though God himself has said in the Bible that you should come to his help. Okay, go to Judges 5.23. Okay, it wasn't God, but then look at Judges 5.23. Okay, all right. It was the angel. Curse Meros. Said the angel of the Lord, Meros, maybe a city, cursed its inhabitants bitterly because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. So here God was saying that you didn't help me. What, what this scripture is saying is not like God needs your help. Of course, God needs man. But God doesn't necessarily need you and I. So don't be too proud. And without me, God can do nothing. Who told you? Of course, he needs man, but he doesn't necessarily need you and my and I because nobody can hold God to ransom. Now, God can come to you and say, now do this for me. And you can say, uh, no, I won't do it. I won't. And, and God may even be giving you grace, grace to be coming again. But never think that you are God's last resort or never think you are indispensable. He said to Elijah, he said, I have 7,000 more people who have not bowed down to bow. So you think you are the only prophet who has, who has not bowed down to bow. He said, no, you are wrong. I have 7,000 more people for myself. For anything that God asks you to do, know that there are 7,000 people standing on the touchline waiting to jump in if you decide not to do. You can never hold God to ransom. God does not need your help. Of course, he needs man to execute his agenda. But anybody can be chosen to do that. When men fail God, God can raise stones in place of men. What are you talking about? He said, if you refuse to praise me, I can raise stones to praise me. Nobody can hold God to ransom. Nobody can give to God. Never say, I have given this to God. You have never given anything to God. You can't give to God. You can't help God. Oh, Romans eleven thirty four. Do you know why? Do you know why nobody can give to God? He gave to us first. For who has known the mind of the Lord, who has become his counselor? Now we have people who are trying to become God's counselor. Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him. What, what did you give that you did not receive from God? Because God is the constant, the unchanging constant. Every other thing must bow to him. He doesn't bow or bend to anybody. That's why he's God. The self self-existing one. The only one who doesn't need another person to be who he is. Is God. You and I, we need God to be who we are. You can never say I am. I am is for God. You can only say I am because he is. The number one is for God. I am is for God. So when you say I am, be careful what follows. Paul said I am what I am by the grace of God. I am what I am. I am because he is. I will because he wills. 
I can because he enables me. I can do all things through Christ. The, the speech of the untrained soul is I am. I can. I will. I am. I am. I can. I will. You are wrong. Nobody can help God. Uzzah tried to help God keep him from falling. God struck him dead. Second Samuel 6 verse 6. The ark of the Lord was, was stumbling. Uh, the, the, the oxen stumbled. And then Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of the Lord to take hold of it, to steady it. And then he was struck. God said, who told you I need your help? You are out of order. And you are coming to offer me help. I don't need your help. So we have to be careful. When, when we don't follow God's pattern, even our good intentions become abominations. The path of hell is lined up with good intentions. People with good intentions. People with good intentions who never accepted Christ find themselves in hell. So good intentions are not enough. Go to Proverbs 15 verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is like, so a good intention is not enough. When, when, when God's patterns are violated, even good intentions, they become abominations. When we try to help God, we will go ahead of God because we think he's slow trying to help God. It's presumption. Do you know what happens when you do that? You will give birth to Ishmael. Because Isaac is process. Ishmael is strength. The father of Ishmael is different from the father of Isaac. The father of Ishmael was Abraham. 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 The father of Isaac was Abraham. And the two are different. So Isaac came as a result of process. Abraham, the name was changed. It was a journey, a process. Then Isaac came at the right time. When Isaac came, there was no strength in Abraham. So he could never claim credit for Isaac. Ishmael was his own product, his own strength. So Abraham could claim credit for Ishmael. But Abraham could never claim credit for Isaac. When Isaac came, his body was dead. Sarah's womb was dead. There was nothing, humanly speaking, nothing they could do to produce a child. God said, now you are ready for me to work with you. When you have strength, you went about producing Israel. Because you thought I was slow. And you know something? When Ishmael was born, God didn't talk to Abraham for 13 years. God was silent. So when you go ahead of God and then you give birth to Ishmael, God will not kill the Ishmael. The Ishmael will start fighting against you and against your Isaac. The time your Isaac will come, you will see that Ishmael is fighting against Isaac. Because in Genesis 16, verse, verse um, 16, you will see, and Abraham was Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. Then go to the, the, the next chapter, verse 71. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham. 86, 99, it's 13 years. There was a 13-year-old Silas because Abraham went ahead of God. And Sarah said that, you know, God has kept me from giving children, uh, bearing children. So why don't you go into Hagar? You know, sometimes when, when the time, when you think time is going, you can, you can produce Ishmael. I'm talking about what God has said, not, not, not your own thing. Maybe God has given you a promise. And God said, I will do this. But the promise didn't come with date. And then instead of you waiting on God, you go ahead to do something that will look like the result, the answer. He said you are putting Isaac, Ishmael before Isaac. Now, 
The sixth one, using God for your selfish ends is presumption. Can we use God for our selfish ends? Yes. But that is presumption. There's a book called The Man God Uses. But this generation, we are writing another book, The God Man Uses. It is presumptuous to try to use God. But when we say use God, what we mean is that you want to use him as some kind of power. You don't want to, you, I mean, you, you, you don't want to relate, relate with him. There are people who can go for prayer meetings. They are just going to get their needs up. No relationship with God, nothing. Just going for a direction to implement, nothing. All that they know is that the prophet said, take this oil and go and pour it seven times on your, on your sofa and sit down seven times. So that's what they know. They go and do it and sit down. They get results. The next time they'll go for another thing, get results. Never minding God. No relationship. For 70 years, there was no act of the covenant in the tabernacle. And yet, the people were still going to the tabernacle to worship. But if there's no act, there's no God. So what are they going to do? The priests were blessing them. The, the, the blessing that God gave them, number six, the priests were still blessing them. People were still going to give their sacrifice, but there was no God in the ark. Why? Because they didn't care for relationship. They were only looking for solution to their problem. You, you try to use God where you are not thinking of relationship. You are only thinking of God solving your problems. You will use God when you, when you relate with God as you relate to fire, with the fire service. When there's no fire, when there's no fire, do you pick a phone to call the fire service and, 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 and greet them? And say, hello, how are you this morning? I just called to say hi. But when there's fire, you disturb them. Hello, help, help. My house... I, I live at number 19. What, what, please, please, please. When they come and they quench the fire, that's all. You have no business with them. That is how you use God. When you are only waiting on God for your needs, but you don't ask God, what, what, what do you need? Or you think God doesn't have needs? Oh, yes. He said, uh, uh, his, Hannah, I said Hannah was telling God to give her a child. And she was giving God all the reasons. Oh God, I need a child. Why? Because Penina has children. I don't have children. God said, wrong reason. Oh God, give me a child. Why? Because Elkanah, my husband, needs children. God said, wrong reason. Then one day, Hannah said, oh God, what do you need? You need a prophet. Give me a child, I'll give you a prophet. God said, deal. We must understand the God that we serve. You can't use God. No. No. The God that you will not call upon in the day of peace. Don't call upon in the day of trouble. If you won't call upon God in the day of peace, don't call him in the day of trouble. Because you can't use him. People sometimes want God to work magic in their life. God is not a magician. Everything God does, it goes through process. Even if he speaks out the process, he never violates process. It will go through process. You have to receive his word. You have to take the word and believe the word and act on the word to see God move. There are protocols concerning God's power. There's no shortcut. Don't be like Naaman who said, I, I thought he would come and, and lay hands and do something and then the leprosy will go. Man of God said, no, go and bath in Jordan seven times. And that's all. Naaman was presumptuous. He wanted to, to, to get healing on his own terms. You have to go through the word. You have to go through what God said. You have to know what God has said. You have to build a relationship. Number two, we use God when we want him to solve our problems but we don't want you to touch our pigs. Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. There was this madman who was troubling them. 
the whole community was afraid of the madman. Then Jesus Christ came and healed the madman. Then the demons in the madman begged Jesus to allow them to enter the pigs. There were about 2,000 pigs. And uh, what is 6,000 demons for 2,000 pigs? So the demons, the pigs were overwhelmed. They rushed and they, they, they got drowned in the sea. When their owners came, go to verse. Okay. Then at once, Jesus gave permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the head ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine came and they told the city in all the country what had happened. Now, when they came, you know what they do? What they did? When they came, they were afraid. Go to your next word. They were, they were afraid. The people, the owners of the pigs, they told Jesus, please get out of this place, this, this country. They began to play with him to depart from their region. Because they were peeved. If you have gotten your demons to cast, what, why do you have to touch our pigs? Meanwhile, the madman was, was terrorizing them. So we are like, oh God, solve my problem, but please don't touch my pigs. It's presumptuous. You are using God. Oh God, give me this, but, but please, this other thing, don't talk about it. Sometimes, you know, God, God is a loving God. So sometimes he doesn't answer certain, certain prayers we pray. Out of mercy. Yes. If God were to give you over to your own last, you will not last. If God to answer some of your selfish prayers, some of our selfish prayers, we will not last. We will self-destruct. So sometimes God will not answer some, some prayers so that in his mercy we can grow and we can learn. So, we must stop using God for our selfish ends. Sometimes, when we need things, the way we approach God, when we get things, the way we take Him for granted, is we are using God. Number seven, another signpost on the way of Cain is trying to move God through sacrifice without love. Trying to move God through sacrifice without love. You cannot bribe God. You cannot do anything for God to change his mind. If God says no, it's no. If he says yes, it's yes. Okay? You cannot get God to, to change his mind to do things that he was not already minded to do. That's why sometimes... You can, you can say things like, no, I'm really going to fast. I'm really going to fast dry. 30 days dry. And I'll get God. You will fast and fast and fast and fast. When you come, God will say no. I said no. If I said no at the beginning, I'm still saying no. Your fasting cannot change my mind. You can't bend God's will. You know what fasting does for you? Fasting strips you of the flesh so that you can hear God clearly. The fasting is not to bend God's will. No. It's not to bend God's will. And you know why Jesus said we will fast? Jesus said that the disciples were not fasting. Then people asked him. He said, how can they fast when the bridegroom is here? With them. By the time will come, the bride will be taken away and then they will fast. Which means that when Jesus leaves us physically, then that is when fasting will become important. Why? Because we have to fast to, to suppress the flesh so that our spirit can get in tune with him. So fasting for the believer is fasting as unto the Lord. They ministered to the Lord and fasted. Acts 13. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted. You don't, 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 don't waste your time fasting for visa. Or, or fasting for a breakthrough. Don't waste your time. You see, fast to read the scriptures. Fast to, fast to pray for spiritual things. 
that the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened, you can embark on a fast. Colossians 1, 9 to 11, embark on a fast. Fast for the channels of your spirit to be opened up. Fast to develop your spiritual sensitivity so that you can locate God's will. So that you will do it. Not fasting to bend God's will. If you fast to bend God's will, you can contact the demon. We can't, we, we can't change the mind of God through the things we do. You can't use this as weapons against God. We can't use them as weapons against God. That, oh, uh, if you fast, then God will, God, will do, God will do this, God will do that. Listen, God is your father. Your father is not an infidel. And Bible says, if anyone does not take care of his own, he is worse than infidel. Is God an infidel? So why do you have to fast to get things that you need? Fast to get things that you need. But you, you can fast to c- come into alignment with God's mind. You can fast to be able to concentrate, to, to sharpen your spiritual senses. I know you have many questions. <laughs> yes. And I hope you know I'm not saying fasting is bad. There are some people, they only hear what they heard. Yes, I'm not saying fast. No, no, no. I, mean, I can never say that. I'm just teaching you the right kind of fasting to embark on. Don't fast for visa. Don't fast for breakthroughs. Don't fast for a, a relationship. That you are praying and fasting that God will turn the mind of that person of that person to you. Don't waste your time. God will not answer that prayer. If you like somebody, go and tell the person. <laughs> go and tell the person and stop worrying God. We worry God with some of these things. God can give you wisdom, can give you insight, knowledge, counsel. And you move. You are now fasting. For God to turn somebody's mind. No, no, no. If you fast, don't waste your fast. Fast and pray to develop spiritual strength. When you have a habit that you want, fast and pray for your inner man to be strengthened. Ephesians 3, 14, 17. That your inner man may be strengthened with might by spirit. These are scriptures that you must use to fast. Now we are raising many believers who don't know the Lord. Who only follow men of God. They don't know the Lord. They only they follow men of God. Listen. Listen. It's not bad to follow men of God. But you must learn how, you must learn how to cultivate your relationship with God. One day, your man of God's phone will be off. And then you, you will need God. What would you do? You better learn how to pray on your own. Better learn how to pray. I was telling uh, some people, I said that now I've seen that prayer warriors, you can't trust them. Because I know one prayer warrior where he fell in love. It was a serious, a serious matter. I thought this guy, he's praying 24 7. Where he fell in love, my God. My God. <laughs> you, should check, you should check him now. So you better learn how to pray because your prayer warrior may fall in love and, and his attention may be divided. So you bring your very, very request, then you say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you. But he's not praying. <laughs> okay. Now, to sum it all up, there's one phrase in the Bible that summarizes all that I'm saying and balances it. That phrase is the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So what I'm saying is it's not that God does not, God will not use anybody. No, that's what I mean. But what I mean is that it's not going to be your initiative. Not going to be what you want. You are going to have to follow after his will. When he says, come unto me, uh, uh, those who are heavy, I'll give you rest. Then he said, the rest is, he said, 
take up, take my yoke and put it on you, then you will find rest for your soul. Now imagine this. He said, come unto me, those who are tired. Then after he has taken away your bed, then he said, take another yoke. Take my yoke. And then this yoke will give you rest. Do you know why? When you are yoked with him, he bears a greater part of the burden. You just follow along. He is ahead. You just follow along. That's why when you do what God says you should do, you should not think about how God is going to do it. Anything that God calls for, he pays for. You should never waste time thinking, worrying about how this is going to be done. Listen, me, what if there's no money to do something, I will just cancel it. That's all. I, I just cancel it. Because whatever God calls for, he will pay for. So, man's role in the equation is allowing God to use his space on this earth to accomplish his purpose. God chose Samson. He chose Gideon, sorry, because of the very things that Gideon said were wrong with him. He said, I, am, I belong to the least of the clans, Manasseh. Number two, my family is the least of the clans of Manasseh. God said, you are a good candidate. I can work with you. God doesn't want people to work for him. He wants people to work with him. In Mark 16, verse 20, he said, and they went forth preaching the word and God was with them and he was working with them. And they went out and preached everywhere and the Lord working with them. Working. They were not working for God. You don't work for God. He, he works with you. He calls you to come and join him. Work with me. That means that it's not your agenda. It's his agenda. Ministry is not an ambition. It's not an ambition. I want to. No, it's not ambition. It's, 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 a vis, it's God's vision. You have, to, you have to know God's vision and then he calls you to be, come and join him, execute his vision. So it's a sword of the Lord and then of Gideon. So when Gideon and God partnered and then fought, Bible says Gideon and Co won the battle without fighting. You see, when you follow God's patterns, you win battles without fighting. You see, when you follow God's patterns, there are some battles you will win, you will not have to fight. Joseph was going to war and then God gave an instruction. Let the Levites go first. Let them be praising God first. Let the soldiers follow. It didn't make sense. Because when we go to battle, it's soldiers that must go, not pastors. But God said, let the Levite go. And as they were going, they were singing to God. They said, for he is good for his mercy and endures forever. The Bible says, God began to release hailstones. He said, I'm with. And the enemies were fighting each other. They killed themselves. The same happened to Gideon. When you look at uh, Judges 7, verse 18 to 20, Let's read that one. That's the summary of all that God did with Gideon. When, when Gideon said, when I blow the trumpet, I and all who are me, then you also blow the trumpet on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Which means that God will not leave man out of the equation, but it will not be man's initiative. It will not be man's direction. It will be God's initiative. Man will follow along. So Gideon and the hundred men who went who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. Just as they had posted the watch and they blew the trumpet and broke the pictures that were in their hands. What happened? Then the three companies blew the trumpet and broke the pictures. They held the torches in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hand for blowing and they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpet, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. 
and the army fled to Beth Acacia towards Zerara as far as the borders of Abenhola by Tabat. What happened was that when they followed God's parting of the, the sword of the Lord of Gideon, God set every man of the enemy's camp against his companion. So they killed each other. And Gideon didn't have to fight. Do you know why in the Bible God always chose people who did not look impressive? If you look at God's toolbox, God's toolbox is always full of unimpressive tools. He said, for God has chosen the foolish things of the world, 1 Corinthians 1, 29, chosen the foolish things of the world, chosen the weak things of the world, chosen the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are. And the reason is that no flesh should glory in his presence. You can't presume anything before God. You can't presume wisdom. You can't presume might. You can't presume glory before God. When you come before God, you must come naked. You must come like a child. Don't go to God and start bragging. Start telling God, you know who I am. You know I can do this. Like, no, no. You, when you go before God, you must go with humility. You must go like a child. Let's be on our feet. Let's pray. You know, presumption is a very serious, serious sin. Presumption. Very, very serious. Just that, you know, because God, has, God is merciful, God, most of the time, God will, will, will help us, you know, to come into understanding. Okay, but then presumption is serious. We should not take God for granted. We should always know that he is God. He is a constant, unchanging constant. Everything revolves around God. Nothing changes him. He changes everything. He said he's got times and seasons in his heart. He changes everything. I want you to, you see, we have to come to a point where we acknowledge his lordship, his government, his sovereignty. You know, I, I heard a song and uh, it, uh, it said, uh, I know that you can heal. I've seen you heal before. But if you choose not to heal, you are where dying for. I know that you can save, and I've seen you save before. But if you choose not to save, you are where dying for. You are where dying for. You are where dying for. You know, that song came from the three little boys. He said, I know my God will deliver me, look at Nazar, from this fiery furnace. But even if he does not, I will not bow to your idol. I would rather die the, in the fairy furnace than to bow to your idol. I know that you can save. And I've seen you save. You see, we must come to a point where our faith is the even if faith. Faith is not in an expected outcome. Faith is in God. That even if this happens or this does not happen, God is God. God is sovereign. I will still serve God. He said, even if you put us in this fairy furnace, I know my God. He will surely come and deliver me. But even if he does not, he's still worth dying for. When we get to that point, there is nothing God cannot give us. Nothing he cannot, because God said, we have taken a stand. I want us to pray that God will help us open our hearts. Open our, so that our faith will not be founded upon things. Our faith will be resolute upon God. Our faith will be in his power. He said that your faith will not be in the, with the enticing men of like, words of men's wisdom, but that your faith will be in the power of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mante Predeco Shalamahas, O Crepere Satara Mahos, Le Cromahalas, Le Bratara Maco, Sheke Pretete Sikaharas, Encati Pratite, Coco Pretetesa, Le Cobrindico, Da Pratala Catu Selehandes, Lo Crimeta, Mante Menadeco Shenda, Cariatori Bahazere, Loki Mahara Masita, 
tell God, tell God, you will be my God forever unto the end. Nothing will make me change my God. Nothing will make me change what I believe. Paul said, who shall separate us from the life of Christ? He said, yeah, I know tribulation and, and, and sword and famine and pestilence and things to come and things that have already happened. He said, none of these things will separate us from the life of Christ. Paul said, none of these things move me. None of these things move me. He said, I'm not moved. It doesn't move me. God is still God. God is sovereign. Don't presume anything before God. He's sovereign. He's God. He's God. He's Lord. Nobody can question God. Nobody can question God. It is time, it is time to, to, to know who he is in us. Not just who we are, but who he is in us. Who he is in us. We have to know who we are in Christ. And so that we even, we even use it against God. We must move from who, he, who we are in Christ into who he is in us. We shouldn't go the way of Cain. Presumption. Presumption is a sin against God. We shouldn't attempt to use God. Attempt to bend this world. You cannot do God without a servant. You cannot do God's will without a servant. Without his will. You can't do God a service without his will. He knows what he wants. He knows what he likes. You can't assume for God. We don't use the Holy Spirit. He uses us. We don't use the Holy Spirit. You can't use him. He's not a force. He's a person. You can't, you can't, you can't use him. He's not a force. He's a person. He knows when to, when to, when to, when to, when to do things. You can only come into alignment. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We are praying this prayer also. We are praying that God will grant us serenity of mind to be able to divide this word that I've preached. If you don't, if your mind is not serene, you can't divide. You'll be confused. You may go to an extreme and say, okay, now we are saying that now this and that. But let's pray that God will grant us serenity. We can divide the word of truth. Every truth is balanced. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Cobra Hatara Mako Shendere. Le Paracatami Yalama Ko Shenderes. Hori Batara Bakoli Yalamaha Sikelemaha. In Nama Hatala Mako Satele Makala. In Napara Ko Chebrede Tebando Shendemaha. Le Kabarata Maliado Salemakun de Brehedes. Ande Brede Kosha Kabarada do Sendere Balaza. Le Kro Maliatan Balabahalas. Oh, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Without you, we can do nothing. It is only by your grace. Brokenness is what qualifies you for grace and mercy. Brokenness. Brokenness. The degree to which you know that without him, you can do nothing. That is brokenness. It will make a prayer warrior out of you. It will make a prayer addict out of you. If you truly know that you cannot do anything without him, that knowledge will keep you, will keep you close to God. The fear of God is not running away from God. The fear of God is to be afraid to be without him. The fear of God is when you are afraid to move without him. When you are afraid to move without what he has said. It's not to run away from God. All the areas that we have been presented to us, forgive us, Lord. All the time that we have thought, we have, we have, we have thought we could hold you to ransom. Forgive us. Forgive us. All the time that we have thought that 
we could bend your will. Forgive us. All the times that we have believed in ourselves and not in you. Faith is not self-confidence. Faith is not believing in yourself. Faith is believing in God. Believing in God. Faith is in God. Faith is not in yourself. It's not in, in, in an expected outcome. It's not in any result. It's in God. It's in God. Period. It's in God. I believe in God. I believe He's faithful. I believe He's true. I believe He's a healer. Even if I did not get healing, I still believe He's a healer. That is faith. We must check the foundation of our faith. Our faith should be placed in God and who He is. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. We are praying this last prayer for Ghana. We are praying that the hand of God will still continue to be on this nation. People have said many things. I've heard um, people talking about some kind of um, instability that is coming to Ghana and all that. But we are praying everything the devil has planned for this nation we stand as a church. We are coming against in the name of Jesus. We lift the banner of Christ upon the soil of Ghana. Any agenda of the wicked one to take this nation back. To take this nation back. We frustrate that agenda and we destroy it. Begin to pray. Lift up your voice and declare into the soul of this nation that Ghana will live in the name of Jesus. Ghana will not die. That the plan of God for, for Ghana will stand. Prosperity will come to Ghana. Ghana will flourish one more time. In the name of Jesus, Ghana will flourish. Ghana will flourish. Ghana will take her place. Will take her place as the firstborn of Africa. In the name of Jesus, the hand of God will lift Ghana up on high. In the name of Jesus. The church will arise and the voice of the church will drown every other voice on this land. The banner of Christ is exalted in Ghana. In the name of Jesus, we declare the gospel has free course. The gospel is flowing unhindered in this nation. In the name of Jesus, we Ghana is bathed in the blood of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray for our leaders. We pray for wisdom. In the name of Jesus. Any good plan they have. Let the breath of God. Be released on those plans. Let those plans. Come to fruition. Any evil selfish plans. We cast those plans. Let those plans put and die. Let them never see the light of day. In the name of Jesus. Let only what God has determined for Ghana stand. Let the counsel of God for Ghana stand. In the name of Jesus, even as we celebrate, we move into our 66 independence celebration. We pray that, oh God, let this be a turning point for Ghana. In the name of Jesus, let things turn around for good. In the name of Jesus, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for what you have released into our spirit. Help us, Lord, not to walk in the way of Cain. Help us to walk in the path of righteousness, in the path of humility in the path of relationship, in the path of faith, in the path of the fear of God. We thank you. We bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope you were blessed. For more of this, download Apostle Joseph Minter app on Google Play Store. 
and also available on all podcast platforms, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Spotify, and so many more. You can also visit our website, www.torchworldministries.com. Torch World Ministries, we reach, disciple, equip, and release. Be blessed.